Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 12, Evan Spencer. Evan, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me, Chris. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Um, my first question to all my guests, where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Ah, great question. Uh, I've been a, a people kind of focused person pretty much my entire life. Um, when I started work vocationally, it was actually as a pastor. So I spent 10 years, first five years was uh, serving students and uh, working with a, a large team of volunteers that were helping helping people get through, young young people get through adolescence, which is never, never a joke. <laughs> and then uh, the last five uh, were working with a small group of families here in the neighborhood of Mahogany. So uh, that actually led me into kind of falling in love with community work. Um, all through there, there was tendrils, like would have done stuff with uh, the students that I was working with. Like I, I did a trip where instead of going away to serve, we stayed local and we we built a community garden shed and we did graffiti abatement and some of that. So the tendrils started there, um, but ultimately led to me kind of diving in whole hog in my neighborhood here in Mahogany and getting involved. And then just as as you're any volunteer with uh, some enthusiasm and some capacity quickly finds out, you keep giving getting given more and more responsibility. And before I knew it, uh, Councillor Keating was knocking on my door about a year ago. So that's, <laughs> it was just a, just a progressive journey. So there you go. But were your family political? Do you get the political mm -hmm. bug from them? Or is, are you sort of the black sheep of the family and you're the first one to enter politics, the political arena? Yeah, definitely the black sheep of the family. <laughs> uh, I would have grown up in a home that uh, I mean, we certainly weren't, there wasn't a whole lot of negativity. Like we, uh, we definitely um, respected people that gave their life to public service. But I mean, there was certainly was a, a fair, a fair amount of like, you know, a healthy cynicism, or maybe sometimes a not so healthy cynicism of, of what, what went on in those powers of hall, or the halls of power rather. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm, I kind of, I'm, I'm bucking the trend a little bit here for my family. And uh and, and hoping I can I can uh, help them uh, see that some really good things can happen uh, when when people good people get involved. Now you have announced that you were running for Ward 12, hence why you're on the show uh, yeah. earlier last year and in May of this year we had your potential replacement, Councillor Keating, on the show to talk about his time in office. Why now? Why did Evan Spencer decide? 2021 was going to be the time that he was going to put his name in the ring. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I've been kind of wooed in this direction, I would say. Um, so I, I, I was doing a, a variety of different um, kind of just neighborhood projects, one of which was a neighboring initiative based on um, the abundant community uh, model that they have up in Edmonton. So I was writing a grant for that and got on the radar and then also been running into folks like uh, former MLA uh, Rick Frazier and uh, and then also meeting Councillor Keating in a coffee shop to talk about neighboring. Um, so when when the future of the ward was kind of and, and Councillor Keating was getting to that point where he's like, okay, um, I think I'm done. Of course, some conversations start and uh, uh, Rick would have reached out early on and said, hey, Evan, um, you need to consider this. And then uh, Councillor Keating kind of followed up and invited me into his office to look under the hood. And, and ultimately when Rick decided he didn't, uh, he wasn't gonna run this last uh, term, uh, that's when I, I, I started talking to my neighbors and they were all very supportive. And uh, I was able to convince my wife, which of course was the biggest, <laughs> <laughs> yep. the biggest hill or mountain I had to climb. Uh, and yeah, here we go. I, I, I've learned a lot in the last year. Um, look, and, and one of the things I've quickly grown a respect for is just what happens in those governance um, conversations um, and just how much they impact your day-to-day -day life. Uh, I really uh, have a lot of respect. Um, I had respect before, but I really didn't understand um, how much weight folks that put themselves into that forum carry on their shoulders on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I also kind of carried a little bit of that in the pastoral world. I mean, there's people have a whole variety of uh, conflicting ideas on a whole bunch of stuff yeah, in that world. And it kind of, you know, started to thicken my skin. <laughs> uh, so I'm hoping I can make the, a good clear jump into this form as well. 
so I've talked to candidates from all backgrounds, whether it be first time candidates like yourself, uh, long term candidates, and I ask them the same question and I always find it interesting. When you originally get the idea to run for council, people approach you like uh, Rick did and like Councillor Keating did uh, for you. You have an idea what you think are the issues that are facing the people that you are going to represent. You start talking to the residents of Ward 12. Were the issues that you thought were the ma major issues for Ward 12 what you were hearing at the doorstep? Or were you surprised at what you were hearing at the doorstep when you were getting approached, when you were asking people, what are the issues facing you? Right. Um, not too much surprise. Um, I mean, I think just a part of that is just where Calgary's at right now, right? I mean, it's pretty easy to put your finger on the pulse of there's some economic um, uncertainty right now. So of course, people want to talk about that at the doors. And then we've just had this, I mean, when, when you've come in after someone's been there for a long time, it, it allows for uh, misgivings to, to root and to grow, right? And so when you think of a mayor that's been there for 10 plus years and Councillor Keating, um, very similar time frame, um, there's people that really like uh, those folks and really appreciate them. And then there's folks that have allowed those frustrations to grow and be tended over. So you find you find people that um, are very quick to tell you exactly what they think. And, and certainly when it when it comes to, I think to, to City Hall, we're, we're dealing with some real trust issues. Um, and, and I'm really hoping I can help bridge that gap by being a personable, approachable, listening ear and somebody that is here and has young kids in the ward. And so if I mess this up, my kids are gonna be <laughs> giving me the gears all the way through. Like it, I kind of hit that demographic of the families that are here in ward 12 making a life here. So uh, certainly certainly would be fully open to being a conduit for and a voice for the, the families here in Ward 12. I want to pick on some pick up on something that you just said, trust. There's a there's an issue with trust with the people at City Hall and the connection between City Hall and the residents of Calgary. I hear that all the time up here in Ward 10. I hear people talk about how what's happening at city hall doesn't get addressed at in the the communities or what's happening in the communities doesn't get addressed at city hall how do you see yourself how do you see your voice being needed in the next term of council to address the trust issue but also the communication issue of getting the people's voice in ward 12 to city hall yeah that's great uh i love that question i i feel that i'm kind of uniquely tooled uh, to be somebody that can appeal to the, the widest base of, of folks here. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to do it for folks out on the extreme right. I'm not going to do it for those out on the extreme left. Uh, I'm a common sense, nuts and bolts. Uh, how, do, how do we make sure we get the kind of life that we're all after here in Ward 12 fellow? Uh, and I'm very committed to not being partisan in, in that approach. Um, I have no aspirations beyond being a servant in Ward 12. I want to listen well, and I, and I, have, I have a demonstrated track record from the past of doing that. Um, one of the things that uh, I did just before I joined Councillor Keating's office was as the volunteer coordinator here in Mahogany. Uh, it's a late community, a lot of people with money here. And when you live in a place where you're paying essentially another level of taxes uh, to a homeowners association, of course, that's going to come with the the entitlement that uh, people get when they start paying uh, into a government. It's essentially another governance system to a certain extent, right? So yeah. what I found very quickly is the more that you listened and the more that you gave them a, a conduit from which to get involved and to be a part of the solutions locally, uh, it really affects a strong culture shift within uh, a neighborhood. And I really believe that is important. Uh, and that's a gift that I believe that I bring uh, hopefully to the city of Calgary, um, is an understanding that when people feel like they can get involved and that they can be a part of their own uh, solutions locally, that it really starts to shift how people interact with their governance systems. But when it, as far, you know, as, as if they're aloof and hard to interact with, and you're used to getting a lot of no's, you're, you're going to, instead of pouring your time into being productive member at solving uh, issues right around you, you're going to become a productive member at poking holes at how <laughs> and how other people are attempting to do that. So I would like to get 
past the antagonisms and, and work to restore that trust uh, and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be out there with the shovel uh, uh, when it's snowing. I'm going to be out there with, with my garden tools, weeding those beds um, when we finally let them, when the city actually lets us get our hands on them, <laughs> is the hope. So, yeah. One of the areas I want to pick up on that is you, while you were there to represent the people of Ward 12, as a city councillor, and you must know this working in Councillor Keating's office, you were there to represent the city as a whole. You mm -hmm. have to make dis decisions based on a citywide initiative to grow the city. Sometimes your ward might get left behind. It might not get the new sidewalk on that street that needs one. It might not get the tree, uh, the roadway that it's been desperately needed. How yeah. do you envision yourself working with community groups of Ward 12 to say, you know what, we need to look at this as a big picture issue and not just a smaller individual issue because the, what's best for Calgary is best for everyone. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the, that's, I love that, that question as well. <laughs> I, I think one of the things that we can do is, is kind of, like when I think about the city and what makes the city great, is it's often it's the individual neighborhoods. Um, and a sense of ownership. Uh, and, and like, I think if you're in a thriving city, you go to any neighborhood, those people are gonna try and sell you on why their neighborhood is the best and why you wanna live in their neighborhood. And, and they're gonna get a sales pitch just walking down the street from every, every other person you talk to. I love the idea of a little bit of a healthy sense of competition within Calgary in terms of not like, okay, you're gonna lose and, and not get that public funding so that we can get it, but rather it's this generative loop that you get into when it's like, look at our amazing public art thing that just popped up that was community led that highlights this local artist or a festival that just popped up or this small business that is now just thriving and going gangbusters that has the full community support behind it in this other neighborhood. It has this generative, uh, very, it has good feels, it's, it's good feelings around it, but it's a healthy competition, right? Like my neighborhood yeah. better than your neighborhood kind of, kind of bit, right? I and, will disagree with that because I'm from Ward 10 <laughs> and Ward 10 the best, but you go ahead and promote Ward 12. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, one of the big issues that the next council is going to have to face, and I think if anyone is lying to themselves and saying they don't have to, they need to get out of the race. COVID-19 has destroyed the municipal budget. It has changed the way that we have to look at the next, next four-year budget plan that we are literally passing in November this year. How do you envision, envision Calgary working with everyone to ensure everyone is not left behind? Because in this, in this world, we have seen the richer get rich. And I, I quote this from a, an American politician I watched on CNN this morning, but the rich got richer and the 99% did not make much moves in this last year and a half. Yeah. How do you envision Calgary helping all residents in the next four years? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, obviously there's a lot of that conversation that goes well beyond municipal politics. But when I think about what we can do locally, uh, certainly the issue of housing uh, comes up. Uh, I mean, just looking at the graph of, of where we are at right now in terms of affordability compared to uh, 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago, uh, it's, it should be uh, popping off alarm bells in people's minds uh, in terms of just how, like we don't have equity uh, on that anymore. Uh, so I think, you know, public money should be a part of that solution. Um, helping us uh, address it and find creative ways for us to move forward. But I think ultimately, and, and this is, I mean, with this whole conversation, when you get stuck in the left, right, how do, is it going to be, is it going to be the public sector or the private sector? Is it going to be the market or is it going to be the state that helps us get out of this? It's got to be both. Like we, we need to work together on these solutions. And ultimately, I mean, where we are right now in the history of, of Calgary is we have a depressed local economy. Um, even more so now because of COVID. And as downtown goes, so will the rest of Calgary go. And as our uh, revenue base goes, that's going to open up opportunities or close opportunities. So I think it's important for us to think long term. Uh, and when I think about making sure that we don't like that, the people that the, uh, that are going to suffer the most from the the fallout of all of this. That one one of the things we need to do is kind of renew the social spirit that we have. Within, within Calgary. 
absolutely governance needs to get involved and at play, but it cannot be the only thing that we rely on. Um, ultimately, if, if the city of Calgary is what we're expecting is going to, it, that we're just going to grow the social safety net, that we're going, what we're going to do is just entrench those antagonisms of public versus private. Um, what we need to do is have great cross-sector collaboration and, and make sure that individuals and neighborhoods are part of that solution and, and their stories are told. That the, the little old lady that's walking up and down the street, making sure that gar garden produce from her back backyard that she grew is a part of the food security for the young family that's having a hard time and the father's been out of work for the last year. I mean, those stories matter as much as the housing strategy um, that's coming out of downtown. And I think in as much as we're, we, we don't make it feel like Calgarians can be a part of the solution, we're actually going to entrench that downward, right? And, and it's just gonna be more negativity. Like Calgarians want to be a part of the solution. So let's make sure this, the city gives them the pathway and, it, and doesn't say like, hey, we're going to get this all figured out. To start that pathway, and I'm going to quote your website here, evanspencer.ca, yeah. and for my listeners and the viewers, the link to his uh, Evan's website is in the show notes. Sp smart spending. That is an area that you on your website, you have literally a few points about smart spending. That is the first path, first starting point for any path to recovery, smart spending. How do you envision and what do you believe is smart spending? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that for sure smart spending is, is that cross-sector collaboration. So there's things that only public money can do, um, or just in terms of like policy and, and, and tilling the soil. If the city is going to do something to, to really help say an, an industry take root, um, it has to start with policy. It has to start with taking a look at where uh, the climate is, the economic climate, and then making some investment to make sure that the, the, the field is ripe for that uh, industry to come in and plant and grow. So I really get excited when I see things like CED, working in partnership um, with the private sector to do stuff like they did with the film center recently. I mean, that was public money that was invested uh, to get something going. And then I also love, and I love even more the fact that instead of it being like, okay, good job, Calgary. And now let's make it all about us. And let's, let's make it part of our revenue stream and make the governance system the you know, that, that uh, governance or private um, public, you know, us versus them, they sold it right back to the, the <laughs> private sector and said, here you go. You know, you have the experts, you have the expertise. Um, we move a little slower. I don't know what the conversations were in the background, but ultimately they sold it back to the private sector to say, take this and turn it into a rocket ship. Um, that's good partnership. And I think we can see more of that and we should see more of that as we move forward. Um, so that would be smart spending for sure. And then when I think of, one of the things that I think that's, that's, troubling about the way people interact with their governance systems is there we're in a we're in a time where we we think that the solutions are outside of us so there's this consumer mentality that has taken many of us right i i don't i i'm bored tonight so i'm going to um i'm going to order something online uh and i'm gonna you know do some consumer therapy and i'm gonna i'm gonna buy something else I have a mental health issue, so I'm going to go online and I'm going to order some counseling. What it's doing is it's pulling us out of the potential that's right there in front of us. And what I would love to see is the city, instead of um, being being relied on to solve problems, and so and that costs money, right? Yep. Um, I mean, we need to be careful about how we spend our, our public dollars. And the more that we put uh, money through business units to go in and solve people's issues, you just reinforce that cycle that that's what the city's there to do. Um, when the city could be enabling, the city could be activating, the city could be empowering people locally uh, to do amazing things to, again, to be a part of their own solutions in their own neighborhood. So that's where my, where, where my mind goes in terms of smart spending, because um, we have a lot of, we have a lot of money that is already earmarked for taking care of aging infrastructure, and to do a whole lot of other things, including four massive capital projects that uh, are going to be important to the long-term uh, thriving of, of the city of Calgary. So we and can trust me, we will be talking about a few of those major okay, infrastructure sure. projects. Yeah, but I want, yeah, I want to talk about it, uh, one of the key points that you talked about is attract investment. Uh, yeah. We need to bring investment back into the city. I will be blunt, and I, I hate to say it this way, but Calgary is not the only one struggling right now. Edmonton, Vancouver, Toronto, 
we are up against large cities dealing with the same issues we are facing right now. How does Calgary stand out in a world that has devastated the economic industry of all cities and not just our, our municipality? Yeah, I, I mean, you just have to, you have to sell the right stuff for sure. I mean, obviously that's competitive. We're, we are <laughs> competing against other major municipalities, but when you look at Calgary, you have one of the most educated workforces in North America. Uh, we're young. Uh, we have so many young families here in Calgary that came to, to root, not just to, to pursue some oil money, but I get a sense when I talk to people here that even though things are going crazy, I, I don't, I'm not talking to too many people that are talking about jumping off the ship that is Calgary. They're here to, to raise a family. They're here to, to be here for the long haul and they want to be a part of the solution. So tapping into that highly trained workforce, whether it's uh, one of the th ideas I really got excited about was um, re-credentialing Calgarians for, and I've even run into some folks on the doors that have been talking about this, people that already have impressive CVs, but they recognize that there may not be as much runway on that as there used to be in Calgary and are very quickly, uh, you know, they're, whether they're on LinkedIn, whether they're um, taking in uh, virtual studies elsewhere, they're retooling themselves for emerging sectors. So I, I think that's a big part of us moving forward is, is selling that uh, just who, who Calgarians are as an entrepreneurial, hardworking, highly educated group of, of folks. And then obviously just the, the built environment of Calgary um, in terms of like all the opportunity that exists here and then the, the mountains uh, that and the natural beauty that we enjoy and the high quality of life. These are important things that we need to talk to people about. One of the other areas that you need to talk to people about is not only attraction, but retention. Retention is a big issue right now. In my area that I live in, you are seeing for sale signs go up really quickly mm -hmm. and houses go for sale, uh, like selling really quickly. How do we retain the citizens that we already have here, but also retain students? Because that is the people who are leaving our city and not coming back after they get to university or college or go off to explore. How do we retain the citizens and the residents that we have here already? Yeah, I mean, obviously we need to bring up a certain amount of opportunity back to Calgary. So whether it be the tech sector or uh, any of these emerging industries, the, mo the more jobs that are here, the more likely they're gonna be to stay. Um, but I, one, of the, one of the pieces that I heard in, and one of the issues that I continue to raise when I'm uh, in forums like this and, and speaking, I believe is a culture issue. Um, we're, we're a city that uh, really embraces an older value set. And uh, in as much as we uh, politically hang on to those, that we are going to lose more and more of our younger folks that just don't, that look at our province as the, the place that their parents um, grew up, right? And, and, and expresses their parents' values. So I, I think it's important that we, that, that we make sure that we, we speak for them in the public forum and give young people a place to really be a part of uh, the future value sets uh, of, Calgary, of Calgary and Calgarians. One of the areas that your potential predecessor will be handing off to you as the next candidate, next councillor for Ward 12 is the Green Line. The Green Line was championed yeah. by uh, Councillor Keating. He was very much the driving force in the last election and previous before that. I, yet again, I don't, I've not spoken to that many Ward 12 residents, but what are people in Ward 12 saying about the Green Line? And are they frustrated about how long it's actually taken to even get a shovel in the ground? For those yeah. who are not, for those who aren't watching this, Evan is shaking his head very vigorously saying agree, in agreement. So Evan, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's an interesting one. I think there's a lot of people that, just, just given with where Calgary's at right now, are scared. And I mean, obviously it's a massive project. So it just fits that whole, like, let's tighten our belts. Let's, let's stop spending so that we can stabilize things and maybe haven't thought all, like from the beginning all the way through to the end of what the implications are for that. The fact that we've spent, you know, close to $800 million on that project already that we'd be walking away from to a certain degree. Um, the 
all the implications for the city shaping and the rest that comes and how that could really specifically for Ward 12 um, bring a lot of thriving in the future um, as businesses activate along that route and as we connect the rest of Calgary to uh, deeper southeast. Obviously, it's only at 130th right now, but I mean, once if Seton is ever going to see a future um, as a, another little quasi downtown like Quarry Park or um, a place for our business in the future, we need to get the green line out there. And certainly there's a lot of infrastructure around it. But specifically to your question about what are people feeling, I'm finding it's very bifurcated um, on the doors. Like I've had, I've had a gentleman at the door say like, where do you stand on the green line? And I said, I, I want it. I love it. Uh, you know, and he said, okay, thanks. And then closed the door. So, and then I've, but I, I would say more Calgarians, more folks from War 12 still really want this. And they bought down here with a desire for it to be a part of their future where their kids could use it to go uh, to post-secondary, where they could use it to get to their work, uh, to their place of uh, work. So I, I think predominantly Ward 12 still wants this, but uh, there's an increasingly loud cross section uh, of Calgarians that also live in Ward 12 that are very, very frustrated and skeptical about this project. And this, this, this project is not going to be done on election day. Next council will have to deal with it. How do you envision working with your fellow councillors, whoever they are, because there's going to be a large turnover in the next election. Mm -hmm. How do you envision yourself working with your fellow candidates or fellow councillors to ensure that this project finally, finally sees a shovel in the ground and we stop, and I apologize for anyone listening, but dithering around and just gets the project going. Because I think that's the frustration with all Calgarians is like, let's just do it or don't one or the other like we're arguing over nothing right now yeah i think ultimately i mean relationships are going to be key because while we need funding partners right now we have we have people we have various levels of government that are they want to see certain things before it can move forward um and unfortunately it's it's turned into a bit of a um a, yeah it's, it's turned into a battle um, in terms of why is this important? Is it being done properly? Uh, does it make sense? And um, it's become a bit of a political tool. So my focus would be, again, amplifying the voice of the people that have been voting for this over the last two election cycles and working with people that still believe in this project and its future implications for Calgary to make sure we defend it. Um, we defend the, the, the benefits that it can and should bring a city like Calgary. It, Ultimately, it shapes how people live in a, a place like Calgary. And Calgary's got so much concrete. Um, there's no way around that, but it's expensive. And the fact that we have a $7 billion infrastructure gap right now um, is mostly due to our water and to our roads. And if we're going to ever fully realize a, a Calgary that densifies and builds productive blocks that really allow us to be financially stable and resilient for years and years to come, public transport needs to be a part of that unless they start to figure out how to, you know, zap us from one location to another in, in 10 years or something like that. So it, it needs to be a part. And, it, and it's also a very dystopian future in my mind to think of a world where we don't travel together and we, and we travel in these little autonomous pods on our concrete highways. Like, I don't want that future. <laughs> I want a future yeah, where <laughs> we're around people and we we get on the C train together and we that's the future I want. So yeah, I, a, I just I just want a future that I can actually travel again. Like COVID nineteen <laughs> yeah. has changed the world and and I just want to get it and travel. But that's yeah. here nor there. Um, I want to talk about the arena. The arena is one of the other big infrastructure projects that is going to be a hot topic in this election. And I, I hear a few people talk about it, but not as much as the green line. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year, we saw that the project came in a little bit over budget and we see some candidates posturing saying that we either need to relook at it or we need to potentially scrap it. What is your opinion on the arena deal? And in this economic challenge world that we live in right now is it an is it a deal that we can potentially walk away from or do you believe that we actually do need it yeah so the arena i mean the fact that it is now an event center um it yeah. has been kind of from uh early days of its conception i i think ultimately it's it's one of those things that 
uh, will be for Calgary's benefit in the long run. Uh, as much as it would be pain, it's painful to think about outlaying those resources when we're also at the same time looking at all these shrinking budgets and the financial realities. Uh, if, we, if we're going to get Calgary on a positive upward trend, there's certain things that will help us do that and give downtown again a sense of vibrancy and get people excited about living in this city. That's one of those kind of keystone pieces of a vibrant city that has arts and entertainment. Uh, I want that event center done so that we can have massive concerts that people get excited about so that we can host some of the best um, in our world and, and we don't have to drive and go elsewhere. And yeah, I think it's, I think it's incredibly important. Uh, the fact that CMLC is now being kind of pushed out or edged out, I just don't know enough of the details around that. I just know it makes me feel a little queasy like not 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 gross gross but just like oh really like what why are when we're, when we're talking about the value of public private partnership and the need to work together why is it that csec is now giving the elbow i i don't fully understand that yet i i haven't i don't have internal briefings on, on yeah. that uh so it, it, it would be on the other side if i if i ended up being a counselor um that i would fully form that opinion, but uh, I don't like that CMLC is being edged out right now, at least at a surface glance. So let's talk about the other side. Okay. Put on, put on your hat here on October 18th, you're the successful candidate for Ward 12. What is your number one priority in your first, first year to ensure that gets done that you are, that you are advocating for and want to make sure it gets done in the first year? For, for me, the first year is to become a, a student and, a, and a, vo a conduit for the voices of Word 12. So I want to set healthy hab habits right out of the gate. Instead of making huge promises that, oh, I'm going to get the green line going and I'm going to get this done and this done and this done. I want to spend, like I've learned a lot in this last year working uh, in Councillor Keating's office. And I, I think that was part of why uh, he he and Rick were sort of pushing me as, as I showed, a, a, I, have, I have some, I'm a quick learner, I'm a quick study. And I've learned an awful lot, but oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness, do I have a lot to learn. And so early on, my, my priority would be to create some citizen groups and panels of the best and brightest of Southeast Calgary. So that when I'm, I and my future staff members uh, in that office start to comb through reports, I mean, we're gonna be looking at a budget very quickly. Um, once once that election happens, it, it doesn't take long before that next four year bu budget cycle comes in. I'm going to want to be making great contributions, not just sitting back and and just receiving it and getting inundated. I'm going to want to create like I can't do this on my own. I'm going to want to have the best and brightest of Southeast Calgary helping me work through what they have access to and bringing great ideas forward. And so that will be huge priority for me uh, so that they get a quick quickly ward 12 gets a sense that i you know i'm a little bit different in terms of how i'm going to run this office as a counselor and that um there's there's pathways if you want to make a contribution to the future of ward 12 and to calgary there's a pathway here it is here's the first step this is how you this is the first gate this is the second gate and then you get you get on a panel with with evan spencer a uh, counselor spencer and you get to talk about what he's bringing forward to council that would be my number one priority I, I want to ask this question and I apologize if it comes off insensitive. So please, sure. if you don't yeah, want to answer it, just cut it. Okay. You, you have worked for Councillor Keating. Um, you have mentioned him a few times in this interview already, and we're about 30 minutes into the interview. How do you ensure the people of Ward 12 that your candidacy is not just another term for Councillor Keating and you are your own person, you will bring your own ideas. And sometimes you might've disagreed with Councillor Keating and you will be better at doing what you need to do to represent the people of Ward 12. Yeah, I mean, as much as I'd love to be able to say something that would <laughs> change everybody's mind, I just don't think there is anything that I can say. I mean, ultimately I think it will come down to them meeting me and and having themselves actually you know listened to and heard and their feedback valued that will will begin to change and that'll be slow um and and for sure that's that's an early you know the very first article that was done on me uh and and word started to get out i only had one kind of negative flare-up and that was it. it was like oh he's just a, he's just 
more of the old because I'm connected to him. But I mean, I'm not. <laughs> That's what I'll say. I'm not. I, I'm me. Um, the, the, the reason I'm doing this is because an established leader saw some of what it is going to take uh, for, for the best of world, to, to have the best of World 12 protected and extended and um, nurtured. Uh, he's, he saw some of that in me. Um, well, and I hope that, more of my Ward 12 uh, compatriots will as time goes on. I, I really appreciate you answering that. It's just, it came to my head. I had yeah. not read any article. I just have looked over your uh, your website because that's what I try to do before each interview. So I, I appreciate you answering that question honestly. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, um, my my the last set of questions is, um, what I hear at the doorstep, and this is me talking to people across the city, is council has become dysfunctional, especially in the last two years with election season ramping up. Mm -hmm. How do you, and I, we talked about your communication style at the beginning, but how do you ensure working with all candidates, even the ones who you may disagree with, and not make it into this, he said, she said, let's bring everything onto Twitter, let's bring everything onto Facebook, because it doesn't benefit the city. How do you envision yourself working with everyone, even those you might disagree with? Yeah, uh, relationship building is going to be another massive priority. Uh, when I talk about becoming that conduit of Ward 12 downtown as being the very first priority and making sure I have wise counsel around me as I seek to be a counselor, um, the very next priority would be building relationship with those colleagues. Uh, so it'll, it'll be reaching out often and early um, and making sure that um, I present myself as somebody who will, li again, listen and uh, fully hear out their point of view, even if it's not something that I'm able to get fully behind in that moment, so that they know they have someone that is not going to bite um, right out of the gate, right? But they're going to have somebody that is going to really, uh, if they, because a lot of times this is something people have worked really hard on. Um, and it's a little piece of them every time they bring it to a colleague to say, are you going to help, you know, will you vote for this? Um, I want to, I want to, I want to help people feel like they're all working together as a part of us moving forward. Um, even if I can't agree in the moment, right? And, and as I share that feedback, um, I also value them at the same time. That's certainly one of the things that I, I attempted to do, like I can still remember the, the conversations I have with three or four volunteers that I, I, whose relationships I just couldn't repair <laughs> with, right? Because I, I had asked them for a certain level of commitment and I kind of, or, or I had told them something, was unable to follow through. Um, going back and repairing those relationships is important to me. Um, people are key. Policy is important. My, my three Ps are positivity, possibility, policy, but ultimately what binds all of that together is a focus on people. Like I, this, a municipality, I love it. municipal politics. It's, it's small enough to, to really get your hands on. Um, and, and that's the only reason I'm, I'm willing to do this is because it relationships are important still. Um, I am conscious of the time here. We're about 40 minutes into the interview. I have one set of questions I want to talk about before we go. Why should you be the next counselor for Ward 12? Uh, well, one of the reasons that I ultimately decided to run that, that made me feel like a, a sense of pers personal responsibility is I wanted, I wanted representation that didn't already come from a certain slant. Um, so I, I, I really have put myself out there as a, a nonpartisan candidate. Um, I, I'm, I wanna be a bridge builder. I wanna be somebody that can help neighbors of different stripes um, and different political ideologies. And it's just in this hyper tense situation that we find ourselves in that's amplified by social media and all the rest and our news cycles. I wanna be somebody that can help humanize the conversation. So, I mean, if, that, if that's not enough to help get me elected, so be it. I'm gonna keep doing that work uh, in my neighborhood, on my street um, and at the neighborhood level. But I think that's really important that we continue to see everybody as a human being, um, even if we can't agree with them in the moment. So that's one of the reasons why I think it should be me, um, ultimately that gets that chair. And then the second one that really jumps to mind is, uh, I'm, I've always been somebody that's been really motivated by the why behind uh, when I get out of bed in the morning and I go about doing my work, 
um, ultimately, I want to leave the world a better place. I mean, I think every politician says that to a certain extent, right? Or every elected official says that. Um, but I, I genuinely want to leave a positive contribution behind me. And I would work very hard to do so and, and recognize that I can't be the hero of that. I can be I can be the one that hopefully, potentially, will gather enough of the voice of Ward 12 and the momentum of Ward 12 so that we actually cause some really cool change and some seismic shifts that Calgary needs to happen. I'm never going to do that on my own. So the fact that I'm willing to collaborate right out of the get-go and, and not not I don't already have it all figured out and I don't have this needs to happen, this needs to happen, and this needs to happen before, I, I think that makes me a better candidate as well. So. Um, yeah, this will be airing on September 1st. You will have about a month and a half until the election date. Uh, you will be ramping up, I'm assuming, if you haven't already, for the election. You will need volunteers. You will need to be reaching out to as many people as possible. So how can people of Ward 12 find you? How can people learn a little bit more about you? Because that is the thing that you will want to be doing is getting your face in front of most people, but also connecting with people. So how can people connect with you? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm on a variety of social media channels, Spencer for Ward or Spencer 412. So the at Spencer for 12, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and then also website is uh, www.evanspencer.ca. Uh, you can find a variety of ways to get involved on there. And then uh, my personal email address campaign email address is evan at evanspencer.ca. Would be happy to interact with anyone on any of those mediums. So uh, look forward to uh, that conversation if it does happen. Awesome. So for my listeners and my viewers, like I said before, I will link Evan's Facebook, Twitter and website and that email address in the show notes. So I highly recommend you get out and vote. Uh, it will get out and research, do your research, find the person that you want to get it behind, but also research Evan if you're in Ward 12. Evan, thank you so much for doing this. It was greatly appreciated. Oh, I, I enjoyed myself, Chris. Thanks for reaching out to do this.